In order to understand the things which drove Julius Caesar's political choices, it becomes important to have, at least, a rudimentary understanding of the Rome into which Caesar was born. Approximately 21 years before Caesar's birth, a desperate man hid in a sacred grove of trees along the banks of the river Tiber. With an angry mob closing in on him, he gave up all hope of survival and killed himself. His name was Gaius Sempronius Gracchus, and he was a tribune of the plebs. Twelve years before that, another tribune of the plebs died a violent death at the hands of an angry mob. They broke off the wooden legs from benches, tables, and chairs, and clobbered him to his bloody end. His name was Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, and he was the elder brother of Gaius. What had these two brothers done to merit such violent deaths? These two statesmen, known today as the Brothers Gracchi, are deemed the founding fathers of both socialism and populism. Both men used the office of Tribune of the Plebs to legislate bills which, had they passed the voting assemblies, would have granted land to Rome's urban poor, known as the Head Count. This land would have offered them an opportunity to become working members of Roman society. Though such legislation seems reasonable, this battle between the upper and lower classes, along with the Gracchi's manipulation of the office of Tribune of the Plebs, would spark Rome's first political bloodshed, setting into motion a legislative pattern which would transform the nearly five-century republic into a military autocracy. The office of Tribune of the Plebs was the first office of the early Roman Republic that was open to the plebeians, or non-noble citizens of Rome. Throughout the history of the Republic, this office served as an important check on the power of the Roman Senate, and its elite magistrates, against the lower classes. The office was created some 15 years after the expulsion of Rome's final king, and the subsequent creation of the Republic. In 495 and 494 BC, a series of clashes between the ruling patricians, clans that could be traced to Rome's founding, and the common plebeians led to the plebeians seceding from the city of Rome in what would be considered today as the world's first labor strike. Suddenly, with the exodus of the plebeians from the city, the patrician upper classes were left with no one to perform the real work. Smiths, shopkeepers, food vendors, horse groomers, cattle farmers, etc., were all gone. In desperation, the patricians travelled to the Alban Hill, where the plebeians had settled their new community, and begged them to return. After much mediation and deliberation, the plebeians finally agreed to negotiate their return to the city, but only on condition that a special office be created within Roman government to represent and protect the plebeians from the abuses of the Senate's patrician magistrates. No patrician was permitted to run for this office, and those who were elected had to be made legally sacrosanct. This meant their person was inviolable during their terms of office. To lay hands on a tribune of the plebs, or to otherwise interfere with his civic duties was an offence punishable by death. The Senate agreed to these terms, and the plebeian population returned to the city. In the year 493 BC, Lucius Albinius Paterculus and Gaius Licinius became the first tribunes of the plebs elected to office by the voting plebeian populace. Each year, two new tribunes were elected to replace the outgoing tribunes of the previous year. Because the task of representing the grievances of the plebeian people was more monumental than anticipated, the two tribunes of the plebs were granted the authority to appoint three additional colleagues. This lasted until 470 BC, when the office was simply opened to five elected candidates each year. The number was increased by another five tribunes in 457 BC, and from that point until the end of the Republic, nearly 400 years later, the office of Tribune of the Plebs would maintain ten seats in government. In 493 BC, when the office was created, Tribunes of the Plebs had the authority to convene the Plebeian Assembly. The Plebeian Assembly was the voting assembly entitled to pass legislation that pertained only to the Plebeian classes. Military officers and matters were voted on by the Centuriate Assembly, which was weighted in favour of the patrician elite. The tribal assembly voted on lesser public offices, and was weighted in favour of wealthy landowners scattered around Italy. By the 3rd century BC however, the tribunes of the plebs had slowly acquired the authority to call the entire senate to order, to lay legislative proposals before it, and to even write legislation for senatorial rubber stamping. But the most powerful tool held by the tribunate was the power to veto. This veto, combined with the office holder's sacrosanctity, made the tribunate the champions of the lower, plebeian classes. No magistrate within the Roman Senate, save the occasionally appointed dictator, had the authority to veto a tribune's actions. But a tribune could veto a consul, a praetor, and even the acts of the Senate as a whole. In the early days of the Republic, Rome's farmers were everything. 
Not only did farming serve as the backbone of Rome's economic success, but her farmers also served as her military force. Roman thinking was that only those who held a stake in the land would be willing to lay down their lives to keep it. Therefore, enlistment in Rome's legions was dependent upon land ownership. Only landed citizens could enlist, and the amount of land one held was directly related to his military placement. The patrician classes served in positions of authority, with the younger patrician men being placed in subordinate positions in order to both assist in and learn military leadership tactics from their superiors. The equites, or knight class, were the wealthy, but non-patrician citizens of Rome's second class. The equites served as the Roman cavalry, and the army's main source of reconnaissance. The third class were those citizens who could afford a set of full armor, sword, shield, and bronze helmet, they functioned as the core of the legions. The fourth class were those who could afford only basic armor, a small shield, and a gladius short sword. These men served in the front lines and were relieved, in battle, by the third class soldiers. The fifth class was the lowest class accepted into the Roman army. Unable to buy any form of armor, shield, or sword, they served as javelin throwers, rock slingers, and basic skirmishers, whose duty was to distract the enemy. From highest to lowest, a person's wealth dictated his placement within the legions, and those who did the brunt of the fighting and dying belonged to the lowest classes allowed. With most of Rome's early wars of conquest taking place on the Italian peninsula, farmers could go off to war for a few months and still have enough time on their farms to maintain the yearly harvests. However, by the middle of the 2nd century BC, with the Punic Wars leading Rome further from the mainland, and for years at a time, farms left untended fell into disrepair, went bankrupt, or were destroyed by local raiding parties. Families had little choice but to abandon the land, selling at a fraction of the value. In addition, with the conclusion of the Punic Wars, and the salting of the earth at Carthage by the army of Scipio Emilianus, Rome's military successes around the Mediterranean brought great hordes of wealth pouring into the mainland, primarily the wealth of captives for sale on the slave blocks. With people losing their farms, and slavery at an all-time high, work for the freed citizens of the lower classes became more and more difficult to find. This led to the depopulation of the provinces on the Italian peninsula. In the aftermath surrounding Rome's Punic victories, great mega-plantations known as Latifundia, began purchasing huge amounts of this vacated farmland. In order to maximize farming profits, the Latifundia farmed their newly acquired lands using slave laborers who required no pay. In this way, the Latifundia became a type of corporation, and to make certain the Senate honored the Latifundia's interests when drafting new laws, a great many senators grew discreetly wealthy. The problem of soldiers forfeiting their land became an issue for Rome's military machine. With more and more landed citizens losing their properties, fewer men met the minimum requirements of land ownership necessary for military service. Veterans, of course, always had the option of re-enlistment, but showed little enthusiasm towards marching again for a state which had failed to protect their interests during previous campaigns. As a result, the Roman army lost some of its prestige as the state lost the confidence of the people. The disenfranchised landowners, and everyone else from the lower classes whose jobs had been displaced by slave labor, were left little choice but to flood into the city of Rome, in the hopes of finding some way to make a living. The streets became overcrowded, the city more filthy. As a result of too many hungry and angry people living on top of one another, violence in the Sabura increased dramatically, murder, rape, theft, and violence all skyrocketed. And, when Rome's soldiers, returned from the legions, discovered their farms and families gone, they were forced to follow the rest of the unemployed into an already packed Rome. These trained killers became the most sought after members of the various street gangs which terrorized the city. Something needed to be done, and Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus decided to be the one to do it. Tiberius was the grandson of famed general, Scipio Africanus, the man who defeated Hannibal of Carthage. The Cornelii were one of the oldest patrician clans in Rome, but Tiberius, born to Scipio Africanus's daughter, carried the plebeian status of his father who, though very wealthy and a holder of high public office, was not a patrician. Tiberius earned his first taste of fame as a young military tribune alongside his uncle, Scipio Emilianus, when the ruthless general raised Carthage to the ground and salted its earth. Tiberius, according to legend, was the first man over the walls of Carthage before the city fell. According to Plutarch, Tiberius, while traveling to Numantia, noticed, as he passed through Etruria, the province's utter depopulation. Slaves from distant and exotic places worked the lands while the Italian husbandrymen and women had all but vanished. Conceiving a plan to correct this wrong, 
Tiberius ran for election as Tribune of the Plebs. He intended to pass into law a land reform bill called the Lex Sempronia Agraria. This bill was basically designed to force wealthy senators holding more state-owned land than was legally allowed, to surrender the difference to Rome's poor so that the disenfranchised could, once again, move back into the country to earn their livings. This bill, if passed into law, had the potential to lower crime in the city by creating a new crop of landowners, improve Rome's economy by putting coin back into circulation through the creation of new farmers, and help stabilize Rome's decreasing military prestige by increasing the number of men who met the required land holdings necessary for enlistment. This state-owned land, known as the Age of Publicus, was not simply a plot of land one could point to within the city of Rome, but large tracts of land in every province which, through conquest, now belonged to the state. This land could be used for anything, from the creation of settlements made up of retired military personnel, to public parks and gardens, or even the construction of whole new cities. Until the lands were earmarked for specific use, however, contracts to farm the lands were granted so that, at the very least, the vacant land brought in revenue. This led to the wealthiest patricians bribing officials for contracts, and gobbling up most of the land in question. Unfortunately, when the time came to settle legions somewhere, or build a new town, the contract holders who did not want to give up the extra income farming free land provided them, ruthlessly fought the proposed legislation. Even before the close of the Punic Wars, this problem had gotten so out of hand that in 367 BC, two tribunes of the plebs named Stolo and Lateranus promulgated new laws that restricted, to one Ugera, 325 acres, the amount of state-owned land for which any person might hold a farming contract. Yet, contracts far exceeding this limit continued under the table. Tiberius's bill was meant to take only the land exceeding the legal 325 acres per person, and redistribute the difference among Rome's urban poor. But, just as it would be today, when redistribution of wealth legislation was proposed, there was a great division between the haves and the have-nots. Rome's wealthy fought to save the revenues they had succumbed to depend on, while Rome's urban poor behaved as if the lands in question, even lands as far away as Macedonia and Thrace, upon which Rome's urban poor had never stepped foot, had somehow been stolen from them personally. And yet, what is most important about the politics of Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus is not in whether he won or lost his land bill, but in how he utilized the office of tribune of the plebs in this noble battle against the Senate of Rome. Because Tiberius knew the Senate, holders of most of the illegal land in question, would oppose his legislation, he vowed to bypass the Senate altogether, and take it straight to the plebeian assembly, his legal right as a tribune of the plebs. The Senate, however, responded by approaching another tribune of the plebs, a wealthy landholder by the name of Marcus Octavius. Octavius was urged to use his veto at the plebeian assembly to prevent Tiberius's succeeding. When Tiberius began reading his bill to the people, Marcus Octavius vetoed. This led Tiberius to call for the immediate removal of Marcus Octavius from office because, by protecting the interests of wealthy senators, he had failed in his duty as a tribune of the plebs to protect the common people from political or economic oppression by the Senate. The people voted to depose Marcus Octavius from office, but once again, Marcus vetoed the motion before the vote could be finalized. What developed from this standoff was an eye-opening appreciation of the tribunate's power. Until everyone in the Senate was prepared to allow Tiberius to present his legislation to the plebeian assembly, he would simply hold the government hostage. Using his own power of veto, Tiberius stopped all business, all trade, all production. He vetoed the law courts, the cattle market, and the criminal courts. He even vetoed meetings of the Senate. Through the use of his veto, Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus brought the city of Rome to a screeching halt. With the city shut down, and its citizens unable to work, Tiberius's senatorial opposition whispered that, with so much power, the love of the masses, and complete control over the city, Tiberius aimed to make himself, King of Rome. The rise of a new King of Rome was, to the Romans, the bogeyman they all feared. Any attempt by a man to circumvent the process of collaboration with the Senate was quickly viewed as aiming for individual power. Ultimately, this rumor allowed Tiberius's enemies within the Senate to manage his death at the hands of an angry mob they had successfully convinced of his personal ambitions. Unfortunately, Tiberius Gracchus's land bill did not get off the ground. Yet before his death, he had clearly demonstrated just how much power a tribune of the plebs could wield over both the Senate and people of Rome. Ten years later, as tribune of the plebs, Tiberius's younger brother, Gaius Sempronius Gracchus, would attempt to use this same office to push through his own radical reforms. 
Though already popular as the brother of Tiberius and grandson of Scipio Africanus, Gaius would gain even more acclaim with the common people by passing into law a program called the Grain Dole. This program offered, at state's expense, subsidized grain for those of Rome's poorest citizens who met the appropriate means test. This was Rome's equivalent of the welfare system, and earned Gaius Gracchus the support of the plebeians. Gaius also legislated for Roman citizenship to be granted to Rome's Latin and Italian neighbors on the peninsula. This attempted legislation, which would give Gaius Gracchus the largest constituency, would make him the most powerful man in Rome. Unfortunately, a second attempt at pushing through a land reform bill, similar to his late brothers, pushed the Senate too far. Gaius Gracchus became the recipient of Rome's first ever Senatus Consultum Ultimum. This decree, backed by the Senate, gave the Roman consul carte blanche to take any necessary actions in a crisis which threatened the security of the Republic. He needed no vote, no debate, no senatorial permission. Nor could he be prosecuted afterwards. The Senatus Consultum Ultimum was Rome's version of martial law. Thus, Gaius Sempronius Gracchus was named an enemy of the state, and it became the duty of all Romans to harm or kill him. With Gaius's suicide, his political reforms met the same fate as those of his late brother. All of Gaius Gracchus's bills, except for the grain dole, were dismantled by the Senate. With the death of both Gracchi, the dispossessed remained homeless and land reform would dominate Roman politics for another 70 years.